Retinal Rounds, episode number 94. Peripheral Retinal Pathology, part one. Today we're going to review the anatomic features of peripheral retinal pathology, and in particular those lesions that can predispose to a retinal tear or detachment. This is information every ophthalmologist should be familiar with, since identification and, in some cases, prophylactic treatment of these lesions can help prevent your patients from developing retinal detachments. Before we dive in, I want to stress the importance of a good fundoscopic examination with scleral depression. Now, Many of the lesions that we'll discuss are in the far periphery, and scleral depression not only brings these lesions into view, but the oblique viewing angles can help you visualize subtle holes or breaks that would otherwise be missed. While wide field fundus photography is a very powerful diagnostic tool, it is not a replacement for fundoscopy with scleral depression. First, let's distinguish lesions that predispose to a retinal tear or detachment from those that do not. Lesions that predispose to a retinal tear or detachment include lattice degeneration, snail tract degeneration, which has many features that are similar to lattice, vitreoretinal retinal tufts, enclosed aura bays, meridional folds or complexes, and retinoschisis. Now we'll cover most of these lesions today, but we'll save our discussion of retinoschisis for our next episode. Lesions that don't predispose to retinal tear or detachment include paving stone degeneration, peripheral reticular degeneration, peripheral drusen, and typical cystoid degeneration. As you know, retinal breaks can lead to regmatogenous retinal detachments, although not all breaks are the same with respect to RD risk. In our next episode, in addition to reviewing retinoschisis, we'll also discuss retinal tears, operculated retinal holes, atrophic retinal holes, and retinal dialyses. Let's start with lattice degeneration. The photo shown here is typical of lattice degeneration, which is usually located peripherally between the equator and the vitreous base. Lattice degeneration is common, affecting about 7-10% to of the population, and it, along with snail tract degeneration, are found more often in myopes. Lattice is characterized by a central scalloped area of thin or atrophic retina with an overlying bursa of liquefied vitreous and tight vitreoretinal adhesions at the edge. These lesions can predispose to retinal detachments either secondary to a retinal tear or an atrophic retinal hole. Retinal tears usually occur at the edge of lattice where vitreoretinal traction is greatest and can progress more rapidly to retinal detachment. Atrophic holes, on the other hand, can be present anywhere within the bed of lattice and detachments from these lesions typically progress more slowly. Lattice degeneration can have associated sclerotic appearing vessels as is demonstrated here. Hyperpigmentation either at the borders or even within the area of lattice may also be present as you can see here. Sometimes the areas of retinal thinning can progress resulting in atrophic holes. Here, two smaller areas of lattice degeneration have associated small atrophic retinal holes. And sometimes numerous atrophic holes may be present, as is demonstrated here. Now, this picture shows an area of lattice degeneration with a small retinal tear to the left of the image and an atrophic hole to the right of the image. It's important to remember that vitro-retinal adhesions are very tight at the edge of lattice. In this histopath slide, the central excavation represents a scalloped area of atrophy within an area of lattice degeneration. The red arrows point to the edge of lattice where you can see vitreous remnants adherent at the edge. When performing vitrectomy for lattice-associated retinal detachments, it's important to elevate the vitreous 360 degrees around the area of lattice and to trim the vitreous remnants down at the edge. Pulling too hard on the overlying vitreous may result in larger or additional retinal breaks. This slide also demonstrates the tight vitro-retinal adhesions that are present at the edge of an area of lattice degeneration. And here we can see a bursa of liquefied vitreous overlying an area of lattice degeneration, which is a typical anatomic finding. Now, scleral depression can help not only to visualize lattice, but oblique viewing may also help to identify subtle holes or tears that otherwise might be missed, especially in patients with the blonde fundus. Next, we'll discuss vitreoretinal tufts. You can see in this photo two discrete tufts or excrescences of the retina, which have a gliotic appearance and a hyperpigmented rim. Retinal tufts can be characterized as non-cystic, which is the more common variety, cystic, which is less common and has cavitations within the tuft, and zonular traction tufts, which appear as thin strands of tissue that can extend anteriorly from the ciliary body to the retinal surface. 
Now, vitreoretinal adhesions are tight with vitreoretinal tufts, and traction exerted by the vitreous may result in a hyperpigmented lesion or hyperpigmented borders. Vitreous traction on these lesions can also result in retinal tears. Here's another vitreoretinal tuft which appears posterior to the vitreous base and has variable degrees of hyperpigmentation. Excessive vitreoretinal traction on these lesions may result in an operculated retinal hole, as is shown here. Now, while retinal detachments may occur, these are lower risk lesions than flap tears, for example, since the vitreoretinal traction has been relieved. Here's another photo of a small operculated hole associated with a vitreoretinal tuft. And here's a histopathology slide demonstrating the gliotic excrescence emanating from the retina. And it's faint, but you can see hyaloid remnants that appear to be uh, still attached at the apex of the tuft. Now, vitreoretinal tufts may be small and difficult to identify. Scleral depression can help better visualize these lesions when viewed from an oblique angle. This can also help to identify cystic spaces within the tuft and help distinguish tufts associated with cystic changes from those with small associated retinal breaks. And here's a different peripheral uh, lesion. This is a meridional complex. Now, a meridional fold is a pleat of retinal tissue that's typically present at the orus serrata. A meridional complex, on the other hand, is a meridional fold that is in line and integrated with the dentate process and the associated ciliary process. Now, breaks tend to occur at the posterior edge of these lesions, and it is thought to be due to abnormal vitreoretinal traction. Here you can see three meridional complexes, all associated with small posterior retinal breaks. An aura bay is the scalloped area between dentate processes, and sometimes retinal tissue may coalesce anteriorly to the bay, forming an enclosed aura bay. Here we have an interesting finding of an enclosed aura bay associated with a meridional complex and a small retinal break just posterior to the enclosed aura bay. Sometimes a meridional fold part of a meridional complex may have associated cystic spaces as is shown in this photo. Now here you can see two meridional complexes both associated with small operculated retinal holes just posteriorly. And here we have a meridional fold which is in an aura bay between two dentate processes. You can see a small flap tear at the posterior edge of the meridional fold. So again, meridional folds, complexes, and enclosed aura bays all may be associated with retinal breaks that usually appear just posterior to these areas of pathology. Breaks are thought to be due to vitro abnormal vitreoretinal traction, and tears associated with these lesions appear to be less frequent than, for example, tears associated with lattice degeneration. Now, once you've identified peripheral pathology that may predispose to a retinal tear, what should we do about it? Now, this table was taken from the recent Academy of Ophthalmology Preferred Practice Patterns publication. And we'll come back to retinal tears in our next episode, but let's focus on the AAO's recommendation regarding lattice degeneration. It says here, for asymptomatic lattice without holes, the AAO recommends observation unless a PVD causes a retinal tear. Even for lattice degeneration with holes, the AAO recommends that treatment is usually not required. Now, while this is a reasonable approach given the relatively low rate of retinal detachment associated with atrophic holes compared to lattice degeneration with a retinal tear, for example, I would like to hear what the Retina Rounds community thinks about prophylactic treatment. Now, modern lasers can be quite gentle with low rates of inflammation and ERM formation. My general approach, given that I've treated many retinal detachments secondary to atrophic holes, is to recommend prophylactic treatment of these areas since the benefit may outweigh the risk. Now, for asymptomatic lattice degeneration without associated holes or detachments, I generally observe and educate patients on the importance of urgent evaluation should they experience a sudden increase in floaters or flashes. I also recommend treatment of lattice even when asymptomatic if the patient has had a retinal detachment in the fellow eye. And this is generally the same approach I take for other peripheral lesions that may predispose to retinal detachment. Please let us know about your thoughts and approach in the comment section. That wraps up this episode, but please stay tuned for our next episode when we'll discuss retinoschisis and retinal breaks. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.